Today on this old house, we have talked a lot about the crazy roof lines in this building. And right now, Tommy's outside trying to figure out how to make them watertight. We're going to start painting all the clapboards before the installation. That's the game plan. In custom showers like this, this was once the standard. Now this is the rage. Hi there, I'm Kevin O'Connor and welcome back to this old house and to our Concord Cape built back in the 1880s, which let's be honest, it does not look much like a cape anymore. I can remember standing right here about six months ago with our architect, Andrew Sidford, as he sort of talked about this idea of a traditional cape out front and then a big modern addition off of the back. And well, there she is with all of those intersecting roof lines, big walls of glass, and a lot of industry that goes into making it. Just this morning, we had a concrete truck come in here and the boom went up and over the house, brought the pipe, the hose right down through that window right there. And they started bringing the concrete in to a space that Charlie had prepared for us. He sprayed closed cell foam down on the ground. You can see remnants of it sort of turning up on the concrete footing right there. And then Mark and his guys brought the hose in. They worked from the back all the way to the front, pumping it in. They were pretty much up to their knees in concrete. Leveled it out, screed it off, and you can see right here the guys putting the finishing touches on before they're going to polish that concrete. And when it's done, the ceiling height down there is going to be over eight and a half feet. They'll have about a thousand square feet of living space, and probably in a day or two, they'll start framing up the interior partition walls. Let's check out upstairs. So this area right here is going to be a deck outside, and I'll tell you what, we have got all of the trades here today. The framers are still here, the plumbers are here, the HVAC guys are here, and we've even got the electricians. Hey, hey. Hey, Kevin. So what stage are you at? So we're at the stage where we walk through with the homeowner, got an idea of our layout. We're going to go ahead and put our boxes up now, and then we can start pulling wires. All right, things are happening. Thank you. So you've already seen this room before, but it is dramatic enough to see it again. Here are the ceiling lines that match those roof lines you saw from outside. And just this week, our staircase got put in. So we've got steps going down to what's going to be that finished basement. And then up to the second floor, Charlie, I just rattled off a huge list, but I'm sure I forgot plenty. Maybe missed a couple things. I actually was just going over my list. Venting of the bathrooms, dry vents through the roof. You know, they're putting the roofing now. They got to go around the roof fence, get that done. Believe it or not, we are insulating by the end of next week on the second floor. So that means up here we've got to have heat wires in there. Wires, heating and air conditioning, duct work, all the plumbing vents have to go through the roof, inspections have to be done, then my framing inspection just on the second floor. And plaster needs to start, yeah. tile needs to start, which yeah. means we need heat. I don't know if you noticed, we're missing one little thing here. I did kind of notice because there's a whole bunch of holes. I presume the windows are delayed? That's right. Where are they? Ordered them about 22 weeks ago. I'm not going to see them for at least another two. So now we got to protect all the openings, keep heating this building for the plaster and tile guys to get going. All right, well, this is why you're on the job, and this is where things get sporty and interesting. A lot of fun. Thank you, Charlie. We have talked a lot about the crazy roof lines in this building, and here's one spot where you can see three of them. We've got a steep, a medium, and a shallow pitched right there. And right now, Tommy's outside trying to figure out how to make them watertight. Hey, Tommy. Hey, Kevin, how are you? All right, so a complicated roof line, bunch of different materials I hear in yeah, order? You might say there's a complicated roof line, that's for sure. I mean, we've got different pitches and they're all coming down into this one area here. Uh, so, I mean, you gotta keep the roof and the house dry. Right. So it all, it all starts with the underlayment. Now, years ago, we didn't even use underlayment. But then it got to the point where we started using a felt paper like this. It's a, basically a paper saturated with asphalt and it comes in different weights. This is a 15 pound felt, but it goes all the way up to 90 pound felt for different materials in different situations, okay? But today, we use a lot of this material right here. And this is a, basically a self-sealing membrane to protect the building against, in our area, ice dams. But it'll also protect the house if you get wind blown off shingles, the house will still stay dry. So I can see the sort of asphalt top right there. Yeah, serves the a purpose. 
the granules just help those guys stop from slipping off? Or? So it's not slippery. They make it that it doesn't have any granules and it's very hard to walk on because it's slippery. Right. All right, this also is self-adhering. It adheres itself totally to the roof once you peel this off and you can't get it off. But the thing is, is it's also a self-sealing membrane. So if I take a roof shingle, for, a roof nail, and I puncture it, so you can see as the nail comes through how it's pulled all of this sticky stuff the, uh, up around the nail, sealing it. So if water from above, from a shingle being blown off, or even an ice dam, water won't migrate in through this and into the house. So if that's going up there, what is the gray that I'm looking at and why the change? All right, because this is basically for high temperature roof. So if, for example, you were to put a metal roof on here, yeah. it would get a lot hotter than an asphalt shingle roof. And so what you want is you want to make sure that you use this when you stick it to the rubber roof, all right? Because this material right here melts at a lower temperature and it will run down and stain this roof. Okay, so high temp, just where we sort of meet the two just materials. Just where you need it. You need it in this area here where you have the transition from one to the other. If you look up there in the valley, because if there's metal flashing there, you don't want it to, you don't want to soften this stuff to make it weak and it fail. Now you see, Kevin, we covered this entire roof with this self-sealing membrane, all the way up to the ridge, around the chimneys, everywhere. And we've been using this stuff in the very beginning. A lot of guys don't. There's other materials that you can use. Let's say you go up six feet, then you can go to a, du a different underlayment. That costs a little bit less. But we've always looked at it as do it right the first time, spend a little more money up front to protect that building. In the long run, it's going to be cheaper if you have damage to water in the house to get that. Gotcha. All right, Tommy, thank you. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Hey guys. What's up, Kevin? Oh, look at this. White oak rustic uh, uh, beam. Charlie, you left one thing off your list. Yeah, I just left one thing, that's it. A big thing. So what is the deal with this? Yeah, we got a beautiful piece of white oak to work with. Uh, we're designing the new fireplace mantle in the kitchen. Okay, so uh, a little sketch here, is this? Yeah, this is the, uh, the idea. Rustic mantle over the brick fireplace. We've been saving this for years at the shop, looking for the perfect place to use an old white oak post. Nice. The Silvers never throw away old beams. Uh, and what's the idea behind the white oak, Megan? What are you thinking? Yeah, we have a lot of white oak accents throughout the kitchen, so yeah. we thought this would be a nice tie-in. All right, so uh, sizing, decision time, what are we thinking? Yeah, this is 8 by 10. And uh, four faces that I guess you've got to think about, Megan, right? Yeah. Woo different levels of distress, even some repairs, it oh, yeah. looks like. Yeah, those are kind of fun, though. All right, so how are we figuring out what the final size is going to be? Because this is a monster. Made up a couple of templates, sample size, go from there. OK, sounds good. Expect nothing less from you. Mark, you mind if we throw you out for a All second? All right, let me get out of your way. Charlie's got some. And here's the uh, first one, which really represents the piece that we have. So it's about 8 by 10. So we've got the 10 on this face, 8 here. Yes. Megan, what do you think when you see that? Uh, height's great, but it feels pretty large for this space here. Too beefy? A little too beefy, yeah. Now uh, we have another option. Always prepared, Charlie, not surprised. And this one here is really a 6 on the face and 8 on the top. 8 across here, 6 down. Yeah. Megan, your thoughts yeah. on that? I, I love it. I, yeah, that's much, much better proportion for the ceiling height and the fireplace. I like this oh, a lot. Oh, no, we got to cut your beam down. Yeah, we have a winner. All right. And Mark, uh, I saw you knocking some brick earlier. Have you been tasked with something? I have. So anytime we're lucky enough to find a piece of wood like that white oak, we want to make sure we accentuate it. So I do have a couple problems with the brickwork that I want to change. Which are? Well, you can see that there are different characteristics in this brick. We're going to stain this brick, so everything is going to be transparent. It's going to come through. So as you can see, I have the same characteristics. The color is basically the same. But one of the other things I want to do is match this stack bond right here. And the way I'm going to do that is as the brick come up like that, I'm going to bring what we call a soldier course, so the brick is going to stand vertical, and I'm going to bring that all the way across this masonry opening, just so like this. These two existing courses are coming out. Exactly. Are you ready to start demo while we cut this beam down? Yeah, I'm going to start demo right now. Very nice. All right, Megan, it's decision time. Whew. All right. 
this is a really pretty section here. I was gonna ask you how you're gonna cut it, Charlie, but you brought the world's biggest saw. All right, so now we just gotta rip it along this line. Yep. Charlie, that saw is a beast. I love it. All right, this will be our final cut. Put a good bead of adhesive on there, but don't go too close to the top. All right, here's our backer piece. All set, we're ready to put it in place. All right, got a brace for the middle here. All right. All right, now I just gotta center it. Back to Kevin, a little bit under an eighth. How's that? Perfect. You like? Yep. Let me just check this. Oh, Megan, just in time. What do you think? This is looking fabulous. It looks great. Wow, you made quick work. Yeah, we're gonna get some board and plaster over it. More will touch it up. It'll be beautiful. And then, Mark, you still have a soldier course to do down here, right? All I gotta do is run my soldier course. I'll tie it in, and we'll be good to go. It's all yours. All right. You look great, guys. Hey, Abe. Hey, Richard. When we did our first inspection here, we found a 30-year-old cast iron boiler in reasonable condition. And we said, you know, maybe we'll leave it, you know. But we've had mission creep since. We've sort of looked at it. We're going to tie onto some of the old cast iron baseboard. But we're going to add radiant, radiant for tile, another indirect heater. So there's going to be a lot of changes. So it also invites the idea that maybe this is the time. So we're ready to go? Time to go. All right, so with the jacket off, you can see the bones of this thing. So here is the burners right here, and they sit under these cast iron sections. Now there's a series of cast iron sections, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They're held together by push rods right here, and there's steel pieces of pipe in between here. There's a flue collector on the top. So if I pull that, you can see that the burners let the flue gas come up through these cast iron sections. There's these pins. So the gap is this wide. The flue products come up here, collects in the flue collector, and out through the chimney. Now on the water side, that's the fire side. On the water side, return water comes back through here, passes through each of the bottom side of these sections, pushes up through into this common header right here, and then comes back out heated to the building. Okay? Now compare that with the new heat exchanger that we're gonna use, the gap is only this much versus this much. And so it's a power burner, a burner that has force and push to push the flue products through here. And so what happens is by the time it passes this narrow bit, the flue gas might go from 600 to 150 by squeezing it through those narrow gaps. So big difference in efficiency. All right, boys, this can go away now. The new boiler is actually going to go onto a wall. Just careful of the pipes, yep. Okay. So that's not necessarily where it's going to be, but it's going to be wall hung somewhere. Can we just uh, pull the cover? So now, that heat exchanger I was talking about is sitting right up in here just inside this cover and there's a really efficient burner and that'll modulate all the time. Now the flue products are so low temperature that you can't really go into a chimney because there's nothing but a little bit of temperature and too much moisture so it could rot the chimney away. So you can either vent it directly to outside, you know, you find your way to use straight pipe and go outside, but whenever possible, I'd love to see us go up and away using stuff like this as a polypropylene liner you actually can fish this into the existing chimney, using the chimney not as a flue connector, but just as a chase to get this up and away. Thanks, Ed. You're welcome. <laughs> Tomorrow.
So I hear you are painting the outside of our house in the house. We are. Um, Charlie and I, we went over with this weather. It's getting cold and we get a plane. Uh, we decided to paint, all primer paint, all the clapboards before installation. So primer and finish coat of paint in here? Yes. And then once it's all done outside, we'll go back out there and we'll be looking to do some touch-ups. So yesterday you guys primed everything? Yesterday I came in here with my guys. We put a coat of oil-based primer on it. It's dry and it's ready to paint. All right, so we've got the uh, paint gun out. You're gonna spray these? We got the paint here. Uh, homeowner designer chose this nice blue color. It's a historical color. Historic blue, huh? Exactly. So we're gonna be priming the machine and we'll be ready to rock and roll. Let's rock and roll. All right. Well, before we start with the spraying cabin, I'm gonna get my respirator, my goggles on, and then we're gonna spray all the four sides first and we're gonna do like individual boards. I'll, I'll paint the top of it. Two of my guys will remove them and put it in a dry rack right there. So that is moving right along, Mauro. Now, we've actually seen you do this before, right? I mean, this is not new to you. And you, you often don't have this much space, right? Absolutely not. This was a plus, yeah. and I will take advantage of it. All right, well, it looks like you got a handle on it. Thank you, Mauro. Get it. Thank you, Kevin. This is hopping, Richard. Every single trade on top of each other. This is hyperdrive time for us. Everybody's trying to get their stuff in the wall. You got HVAC guys, you got electricians, the plumbers, all trying to get it into their space. How about this space, huh? So this is pretty cool. This is the whole bedroom suite right here. Bed will be out here, looking out at the meadow. Everything's oriented to this beautiful backyard. Uh, nice big shower and bathroom area here. It starts with a soaking tub, sitting right here. Be able to look out the window. Couple of lavatories, nice light coming over your shoulder right here with a couple of mirrors right here. Toilets tucked in here. Mm -hmm. That's really nice. This is pretty interesting industry here where it goes inside the wall to allow you to hang that toilet up off the ground. Nice and hygienic. I love these things. This is the tank that stays right inside the wall. Requires some serious infrastructure. It does. Really, yeah. Historically, a custom tile shower always had one of these, a, a shower strainer, normally in the center of the shower, and you would pitch the tile towards the center and there's almost always a curb that made the water fall back in but instead of having a center drain it's going to have one of these a linear drain so the water will work from the tile and go down into this groove here and go down through a drain right here so this will go to you so I want you to take that right there and that'll go to the very back and now the tile will come here but this entire place space will be filled with mud and allow us to tile and pitch that right towards the back. So this is now flush, which means we don't have the curb. That's right. Curb it can be wet out here and it can just work its way back towards the drain. So if this was typical, okay. How much more complicated is to put the linear drain in versus something like this? It is a little more complicated, uh, a little more complex uh, and a little more expensive, but overall in a shower like this, a curbless especially, it, it's just a great um, application. So I start with our basic drain body, cut the hole in the floor, this sits flush to the floor. It comes with a nipple that adjusts to the depth of the mud bed for the tile. Oh yeah. So that nipple that I'm seeing there looks exactly like the nipple I'm seeing here. It just doesn't have this top. It actually fits into that so you can adjust it up and down. Exactly. And that threaded stainless can be adjusted to get this thing exactly up to the levels for the tile to be perfect. So is this ready to go in? We're almost there. So we're ready for the copper pan if you right, want to grab it for let's me. Grab it. So this is a custom made copper pan, very freshly made. Our, uh, our friends, the Tin Men, helping us out again. Fortunately, we have them on speed dial so they can uh, come through for us as they always do. Not a lot of guys making these things anymore, Abe. Nope. You want to set this in? Let's see how it fits. Okay, 
Somebody gave the right measurements. You're always trusting those guys at the tin shop. So he's transferring the bolt location by making an impression with those bolts with his hammer. So there's faint impressions there, but he'll just trace to transfer his hole. Ready to cut? Ready to cut. So the hole's cut, we're ready to put it in place. Let me get the drain in, put some silicone on the top. We can uh, set her in for good. So the key to this seal is actually a silicone ring all the way around that will bed against the clean, beautiful under part of the copper. That has to be in there for a long time. Just the life of the house. Okay. Coming in. Oh, don't kick it. So the four lock screws are ready. So he keys it slightly and then just tighten them down equally and just squeeze that silicone. So that silicone bead will make a really good seal against the really clean part of the underside of the copper there. All right, so with that threaded piece back in here, at the very end we'll have a trough like this, we'll cut the right width, the linear drain will drop in right here, why don't you set that right on top, Abe? And the final height of the drain, that's set by the tile guy. Right, that's a function of how thick they make that mud to have the tile pitch perfectly. I don't know, that's gonna look pretty good. Thank you, Abe. Great job. Thank you. All right, well, still a ton to do, and we got there everyone is. working on it. Right, I mean, in my world, we still have all the HVAC, we got ventilation, we got some radiant to do, yeah. a lot to do. Insulation, and we're still waiting on windows. That's right. All right, well, so until next time, I'm Kevin O'Connor. I'm Richard Thewey. For this old house here in Concord, Mass. The tile guy can come soon, too. I mean, that thing's huge, I love that. Next time on This Old House. How do we zone a house that we've pulled apart? I'll show you. And you don't want to install any soffits right. for the ductwork. You want to keep this all open. Right, so we're going to zone it unconventionally, this side versus that side. This new deck is going over the rubber roof and the sleepers with the help of this tool and these clips. And it's up on the rooftop with solar panels. And in terms of efficiency, when you go to all black, I don't know, does it help or hurt the efficiency? And what efficiency are we at these days?